Okay, are you ready to go? Uh, good. Sure. Sounds good. We are. Um, we're going to talk. If you if you noticed, once again, Brant asked me for a sermon title, <laughs> and I came up with something profound. Come. Because that was the word that the Lord put on my heart. So I started to look in the word because he, there was a scripture that, that in, in Isaiah 55, which we'll get to in a second, that says, come, everyone that's thirsty. And I felt like that in this season, God is inviting us to come. So I thought, well, I'll just preach about that verse. I could spend, it's a few verses, I, I could spend a little bit of time on that. And... Uh, and because I felt that actually last Sunday morning before I came to church that I was going to be preaching this week and it would be in Isaiah 55. And then I got home in the afternoon and, and the Holy Spirit says, you know, there's a few other verses in there. <laughs> I'm like, oh, should I look them up? Yes, he said, you should. So we're going to, I did all the homework for you. Do you know when you do the group project and one person does all the work? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Just say you're welcome. Okay. There you go. So we're going to take a look at what, what it's such a powerful, incredible word. And um, I think it's going to set us free this morning. So um, in, we're going to start and we're going to go flip back and forth between the New and the Old Testament. And I tried to listen to the Holy Spirit to put it all in order. And uh, in Hebrews 7, verse 19 and verse 25, it says, For the law never... Oh, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Well, I wish I could start this all again. I fl was flipping through my pages at home, and that wasn't actually my first verse. I didn't write Joyce on the first page. What if I'd put my pages in a different order and we forgot to pray for her? <laughs> Welcome to church. There we go. We're going to actually start in Psalm 65. <laughs> Psalm 65, are you ready? O oh, you who hear prayer, to you all flesh shall come. Everybody say all. all. Come. come. Great. And verse 4 says, Blessed is the man whom you choose and cause to come near, that he may dwell in your courts. And now that kind of sounds like, like God chooses only certain people to come. Doesn't it? Sounds a little bit like that, which is why... We never just read one verse. We need to read it all. So who is it that God chooses and causes to come near? I want to know, because I want it to be me. Right? OK. Now, I know, see, we started with that other verse, so you knew it all is in there somewhere. But we'll get to specifics, because they're important. In John 6, 33, 37, and 38, this is what Jesus said. The bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So in other words, he's saying, I'm in. All who the Father entrusts to me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will never reject. And I wanted to start with that because one of the biggest lies that the devil says to us when we go to, to, go to Jesus is like, we're not good enough. We've messed up, which is when we really need to run to him. Or there's just, oh, you know, you've waited a while. I bet he's just like, oh, really? You're going to talk to me now after you've... There's this lie that comes from the enemy that makes us think that when we go to him, he's going to kind of turn his back or on us. And I know you all know what I'm talking about. And we all hear it. So what we need to do is we need to take the truth. The one who comes to me, I will never reject. We have to have that as the foundation for all coming. He's never going to reject us. Never, 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 never. Okay? And he says, for I've come down from heaven not to do my own will and purpose, but to do the will and the purpose of him who sent me. So Jesus actually modeled what it's like to be with God and, and to to do what God asks him to do, which is what, how we're to interact with the Father. And then all through his life, he went and he spent time, and he'd pray and he'd spend time and he'd talk to his Father, and then he'd come and hang out with, with peeps the rest of the time. So he modeled this. Now, in Isaiah 1, verse 18, it says, Come now, 
Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. So who does God choose to come near to him? It's not a trick question. <laughs> sinners, sinners. And in Romans it says all have sinned. We've all sinned. So, so, because sometimes people think, you know, well, I can't come to God or I'm not good enough, all this other stuff. He's saying, hey, come on, let's talk about it. This is where you are. This is where you can be. But it, it requires having a conversation, because if you're going to reason together with someone, it requires you have a conversation with them. In James 4, verse 8, it says, come close to God and he will come close to you. So who does God cause to come near to him? Those far away, we always, I feel far away from God. Just put your hand up. We have all felt that. Isn't this good? Aren't you glad I looked up these come verses? Yeah, I know, you're welcome. John 6, no one is able to come to me unless the Father who sent me attracts and draws him and gives him the desire to come to me. Now, it's, Jesus said, I've come not to judge the world. I come to save the world. He wants everyone. So there is actually a Holy Spirit drawing on everybody, whether or not we come. But when we do, it goes on to say, and then I will raise him up from the dead at the last day. So this is talking about people who have given their lives to Christ. So if you are born again this morning, and if you've given your life to Christ you have, I know you're all looking at me, this is a big point, you have the desire to come. The word says you do. So everything and anything else you feel or think or believe is a lie. So when you feel like, oh, I don't feel like, you know, oh, I don't feel like, I don't feel like reading the word, I don't feel like, I don't feel like, you have to go, you have to say, hey, Charlene read the word to us on Sunday, from now on, from now on, and you just go, I actually, devil, have the desire to come to my Father, to hang out with the Holy Spirit, to talk with Jesus. I have the desire to come. See, when you know the truth, truth is actually truth. But whether it's activated in our life or not is dependent upon whether or not we come into agreement with it. If we come into agreement with a lie, then we will live our lives and make decisions according to what we've come into agreement with, even if it's not truth. Truth isn't automatic. We have to come into agreement with it. I agree that I have a desire to come to God 24-7, 365, 61 years and counting. Okay, I didn't give my life to Christ till I was six, so do the math, 55. That needs, you need to be set free by that this morning. Truth is activated. So you're going, well, but I don't feel it. Yes, you have to activate that truth by saying, God has given me, and I have the desire to come to him. We activate things by our words. We, can, we come into agreement with the, with the devil all the time. We say things he wants us to say, and we think things he wants us to think, and then we act that way. So we, we have, to, have to put our big boy pants on, and we have to take responsibility for our lives. Whatever you come into agreement with, is what you're going to walk in. Okay? Okay, we're listening. Isaiah 55. Wait. So who's got, I'm, I'm going to review real quick. Who's, who is it that God's chosen to come near? Sinners? Those far away? Everyone born again? So we've gone from sinners to born again to everybody. Okay. Isaiah 55 verses 1 and 3 says, Wait and listen, everyone who is thirsty, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come by and eat. So it's like, oh, I have to buy this. Oh, don't stop halfway through the verse. 
It says, yes, come by priceless. Well, now I'm in trouble because I don't think I got enough for priceless because that means there's not enough. It's priceless. Come by priceless spiritual wine and milk without money. Simply for the self-surrender that accepts the blessing. So how do you buy, how do you come to God and get the spiritual wine and milk that he has for you? Like this. Just like that. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but that is priceless. That is priceless. It costs us everything <laughs> to surrender absolutely everything to God. Then it asks a very interesting question. Why do you spend your earnings for that which does not satisfy? So he's actually gone back into the natural realm, and he's talking about money. Oh. And I don't know about you, but sometimes we go to the store, ladies, and maybe gentlemen. There are guys' stores, Canadian Tire and those, you know, What's that one with the Cabela's, see? It was right there, Cabela's. Yes. And sometimes we buy, we're like, oh, and we buy something, or we go out and we go and we buy something, and then you get it home. I mean, obviously not anything from Cabela's, but you, you get it home, and it's like, oh, I don't feel what I felt when I was buying it. It doesn't sad. <laughs> Got some laughter here. Do you know why? I'm going to tell you something profound. Husbands, if you could just close your ears for a minute. Sometimes it's like we're looking for something. We want something to be satisfied in our hearts. And God wants us to spend time with him. Yeah, I'm going to say it, ladies. And we go shopping. And man, we'll go, we think something's going to satisfy something in our soul, and it doesn't satisfy. Y'all know what I'm talking about. When that happens, I would just take a step back and say, God, I think my soul and my spirit are hungry for you, and I'm trying to fill it with something that doesn't satisfy. And then we need to come to the Lord. Because it goes on to say, listen diligently to me and let your soul delight itself in the profusion of spiritual joy. See that joy and whatever that we're trying to get from shopping or buying something doesn't come. You can't fill and meet a spiritual need with something in the natural. You can enjoy things. You can shop. I give you permission. But we can't use it to fill a, a spiritual need. It says, incline your ear, submit, and consent to the divine will, and come to me here. So it's not just coming to God. It's coming with an, with an, with an open ear to hear, and your soul will revive. So those who are willing to surrender to God, that's who he causes to come to him. Self-surrender. That actually activates, that activates the the, what was my word? Desire. That activates the desire to come. Now, John 7, 3, uh, 7, 37, Jesus stood and he cried in a loud voice, if any man is thirsty. Do you notice there's a theme here with the come and thirst? Let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me from his belly shall flow continuously springs and rivers of living water. And then when we pray for people to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and we, will, we pray that verse that springs of living water will come up and out from you. Because because this, this is where it comes from. I'm not just saying something that sounds kind of cool. It's actually a scripture verse. It says, but he was speaking here of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were afterward to receive. For the Holy Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So as long as Jesus was on the earth, that was God's presence on the earth. When he went to heaven, then... After he died and rose again, and he went to heaven, then the Holy Spirit came. Jesus left earth, Holy Spirit came because God wants to be with us. 
And I don't know what it was like for those 40 days for the Holy Spirit to have to wait. Like, we have to understand there is that, that kind of wanting to be here. He so wants to be with us. So those who are hungry and thirsty, he will cause to come to him. Matthew eleven twenty eight says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will cause you to rest. I will ease and relieve and refresh your souls. Sometimes we start thinking that God's only in, interested in things on a spiritual level. He made all of us. He's so concerned about our bodies. He's so concerned about our souls. Our spirit's just that place where he gets to hang out, and the connection and the communication comes through that. But he so cares that he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is good, not hard, not harsh, not sharp, not pressing, it's comfortable, it's gracious, and it's pleasant. Don't ever let the devil tell you that if you hook up and connect and yoke yourself to God, that it's going to be anything other than this, because he says, my burden is light and easy to be borne. Weary, heavy laden, carrying heavy loads, cares and burdens. We have come through one season where physically, mentally, emotionally, relationally, and for many people financially, things were really, really hard. People struggled with heaviness like we have, like in my lifetime. And now we're in another season where everything in the world, it, it feels like everything's just teetering, teetering. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Are we going to be OK? Is everything, what's going to happen? Is everything financially going to crash? Are we going to live in 15 minutes? It, it's just like a constant bombard, bombardment. And so we're coming into season two of this. So it's really important that whenever something like that comes up in, and our soul is aware of it, which is kind of daily, maybe, we just, we t and we come and we say, but I'm yoked to God. And he is in control, the devil is not. And I don't have to carry this. I don't have to carry what if, what if, what if. I don't. And once again, it's, it's really important for us as the body of Christ to say, yeah, I know, but I'm connected to God. So I'm not worried about what if that happens because I know God is in control. And somewhere in our relationships with people who don't know Jesus, they should be able to go, they know the same things as I do, but they're not wrecked by it. They're not consumed by it. They're not depressed by it. They're not overwhelmed by it. They're not afraid. Ooh. Because we're yoked. I'm not worried. Is it looking, is it looking a little iffy? Yeah. Just means bigger miracles. OK. Revelation 22, verse 17, last book. Last chapter of the last book in the Bible. So we get come all the way through, and he ends the book. This is really, I don't know if you understand this from an oh, exegetical point of view, which is a big <coughs> word that means Bible study that they make pastors do. The fact that he ended with this is huge. Come. The Holy Spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who is listening say, come. Let everyone who is thirsty again, yes, say, come. Painful, and that thirsty, I don't know if you noticed, I've been using some amplified version verses here with lots of extra words, because it paints picture. Painfully conscious of your need, of those of need, of those things by which the soul is refreshed, supported, and strengthened. 
whoever earnestly desires to do it, do you desire? Are you catching that there's some, God's repeating some things here. Whoever desires to do it, let him come, take, appropriate, and drink the water of life without cost. Those listening, those thirsty, those who desire. God repeats himself because this is important. He wants us to be refreshed. He doesn't want us to be under heavy burdens. He doesn't want us to be under hopelessness and depression and anxiety and fear. You cannot be yoked with God and experience those things. So the, the Bible ends with an invitation to come. So those are all wonderful. How do we come? How do we come? Here we go. We're in Hebrews now, for the, but it's the right time to be in Hebrews. <laughs> Hebrews 7, 19, and 25. For the law, which is, you know, don't do this, do this, don't do this. Ten Commandments is basic of the law. Never made anything perfect. All it did is show us that we're sinners. But instead, a better hope is introduced through which we now come close to God, Jesus. He is able to save completely for all time and eternity those who come to God through him. So we access the Father through the Son by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father but by me. So how do we come to God? Through Jesus. So the first thing we need to do is give our lives to him. I belong to you. And as soon as we do, we have access to God. Okay, Micah 6.6 6 says, with what shall I come before the Lord? A sacrifice? Because they're trying, okay, I have to come to God. What do I do? And they said, no, because Jesus is the only sacrifice. But they were all worried about, you know, what do I do to get to God? Because they weren't actually living the way they were supposed to. This is Charlene's translation. It's not amplified or anything. With what shall I come before the Lord? A sacrifice? No. No. Express Jesus with your life and walk with him. Walk humbly with your God. So humility, recognizing our need, like we can walk with God or walk without him. When we're walking without God, we are not humble. We're thinking we're all that and a whole lot more. Humble just says, this is who I am, and without you, God, I can't take a step. Moses said, if you don't go with us, we're not going. I can't do this without you. So we humbly walk with God, which is an acknowledgement of, of you're everything I'm not, which is everything. Luke 6, 4, 7 says, everyone who comes to me and listens to my words and does them. My children are not adults. Two of them have children of their own. You know what it's like to speak to your child, and they say yes, but they don't do what you say. And those of you who don't have children yet remember doing that to your parents. <laughs> Listening and does them. I will show you what he's like, because God goes on, he paints a picture with it. Jesus says, he is like a man building a house who dug and went down deep and laid a foundation upon the rock. And when a flood arose, we're in flood season. The, we got floods going on everywhere. When the floods arose, there's no question that sometime between when we're born and when we die, we're going to experience floods in our life. When the floods arose, the torrent broke upon that house and could not shake it or move it because it had been securely built, founded on a rock. So what, how do we come to God obediently with the intent to obey? With the intent to obey. So I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to hear what you say. And then I'm going to do what you say. Because when we, we, we can come to God and he will, we will experience his presence hugely. Like, and it's beautiful. But there's another level of where we come to listen, to func because we're functioning as his body. And I wrote this down a little bit later. I didn't type it out. I added it this morning. Willing to be corrected. 
We have to come to God willing to be corrected because he loves us. We, we correct our children because we love them. Yeah. The Bible actually says if a father doesn't correct their child, he doesn't love them. That's actually what he says. Love corrects. And we have to have that, that attitude of wanting God to correct things in our life. And we have to stop equating correction with punishment because it's not the same thing. And sometimes it's because we haven't had the blessing of being corrected without punishment. I think many, 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 many children have grown up and they've never been corrected without a punishment connected to it. And so they don't understand the mercy of the Lord. And, and it's important. So we come through Jesus, humbly, obedient, willing to obey and be corrected. And then Hebrews 11, 6 says, Without faith it's impossible to please God, for whoever would come near to God must believe that God exists and that he's the rewarder of those who would earnestly and diligently seek him. So we need to come to God expectantly. That's huge. God picks up on that in the spirit realm when we're expecting something to happen. You can, you, there's services we've been in and it's like you get in the room and you can tell there's a spirit of expectancy in there. You can create that on Sunday morning by how you come in the door. Just throwing a little responsibility out there to my grown children. Right? Or it's like, it's like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'm in. Something's going to happen. Something's going to happen at church. John 1, 39 and 46, uh, twice the disciples and one the, once the woman at the well said to their friends, come and see, come and see, come, come and see, come and see. And they brought people to Jesus. Now, we're just going to take a few minutes here to get really personal because we saw the Holy Spirit do some amazing things last Sunday. It was, wow, yeah, it was profound. But I want to talk you through the process of how we saw the Holy Spirit do things. So there was prep, because we're listening. And even downstairs in pre-service prayer, which is great, you should come, there was just like, okay, God's got something. Father, we want to find it. We, wanna, we know you want to do something today. Isn't that what we prayed? We want to we, we get... We want to get so that we're going where you're going. That was, that was how we were praying. And we just said, yes, whatever you want to do, we're going to go do that. And then there was worship. And worship was good. And Selby's on her face before the Lord and everything. And I opened up my eyes. And, and it's not necessarily a physical thing. But I felt a leaning back. And I, and I used the expression of a, of, a, of a teenager going, Mom, can you bring me a Coke? You know, and, and there was expectancy, but I expect that I don't have to do anything. You will come and give to me. And there is a receiving mode. There is absolutely a receiving mode. But with that exhortation, which was fairly strong, I, I felt Brent and I ch chewed this over a little bit. I think there have been on occasion Sundays where we haven't pressed in or we haven't waited or, or we, weren't, we, weren't ex we didn't come expecting and there were things that the Holy Spirit wanted to do that we missed. And see, we need to be able to be honest enough to say, yeah, I didn't come to church ready. I didn't come to church expecting. I didn't come... I didn't go to bed on time so that I could press in. I didn't go to bed in time, and I, so I was tired. We stand a whole long time shopping and doing other things, but it's like during worship, oh, I have to sit down, I'm tired. Mm. I'm just, just going to leave that there. Okay, but my point is, so, so there was this thing, and I, and I said, we, we need to press in more. And, and when I was... When I was, we were done, and then I went and sat down, and Noel actually came, because God spoke to him during service, at t totally different words, but the same thing. And I'm sitting down there, and I'm interceding. There's just, I'm just on the front row, and 
know, it's just like there was just this groaning in my spirit, trying to be really quiet. I don't intercede during the service very often, but I did last week. And I'm like, and I, and I didn't understand what it was. I just knew that there was this, just this groaning for something. And while I'm there, and even though Noel said the same thing, and even though Brent preached about it, about how we have to be ready for that thing, the, whole, the airplane thing, you know, when there's no landing gear, is not the time to start praying. You have to live in that yoked thing. Even though, are you ready for this? There was all that confirmation, and I have finished interceding. The enemy's like, that was really harsh. They're all mad at you. You just are so hard on everybody. You have expect, and it was just bombarding my mind. Did you know that was going on? Of course not. You were listening to Brent. While I'm in warfare, for what's, and so I'm like, and I, and I just lay my heart, I said, Jesus, you know, if I, you know, and maybe I used a poor inspiration. I just want to examine my heart all the time. But, but it's really interesting because in the Bible, when you start reading these letters that Paul wrote, he corrects a lot. He corrects a lot. And, and I have the authority correct. And if I don't, then God deals with me. And I have to do it with the right heart. But this battle is going on. So Brent's preaching, I can tell he's just about done. And the Holy Spirit says, I want you to get up there. And I want, before he's done, before he prays and releases it, come up here and pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because I talked with one of you before the service. So I was prepared to pray for somebody individually after the service. And the Holy Spirit said, did that. And I'm, and in my head, there's all the, <laughs> nobody's going to come up. They think you're mad. Like, they're mad at you. Did it, right? You hurt their feelings. So then this is what you do. You take a look at the, the phrase. In light of that, that's not coming from me. Because I'm fighting this bad love was 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 I gentle enough? And I guarantee you, absolutely, 100%, guarantee you, are you ready? The devil is never going to tell me to pray for somebody to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> He's not. He's not. That's not coming out of his mouth. All the do-do-do-do-do stuff was. So I knew it wasn't the devil. And I knew it wasn't me, so I left God. So I actually came up maybe a little bit early because I thought if I don't get up there, I might not do it. <laughs> so this is what happened. <laughs> amazing, amazing things happened during that ministry time. We prayed till 20 to 2 for people. 22 people came up for prayer, I think give or take one. I kind of counted. <laughs> and all, I got home and I just was like, oh God, you're so good. <laughs> God, you're so good. And I was just thinking about, I just, oh God, you're so good. And then I started to prep for this message and I got to this point. And he said, now if you got prayed for last week, I want you to think about it. What if I didn't say yes? What if I didn't come? When he said, come. There, there might be at times a battle to come, but there will always be a reward. Always. Expectancy. So we learn something. We push through. We push through. And now we have to shift into a level of maturity where we function in that and flow in it every Sunday. That we, we come to Jesus. We come ready. We come expectantly. We come listening with the intent to obey. We're on it. All 
all day, start when we get out of bed, maybe before you go to bed, the night before, God, what's tomorrow? What's tomorrow? What's tomorrow? What's tomorrow? Matthew 22, verse 4, there's a parable where um, it says, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son, and he sent his servants to summon those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they refused to come. And I think the body of Christ needs a paradigm shift because when we don't say yes, we're saying no. So not responding is a no. And it's so much more than being born again. And it's so much more than a Sunday morning response during worship. It's, it's Jesus said, come, follow me. Not for an hour on Sunday. We think we're really spiritual because we do kind of two. Man, I'm looking. Sometimes I'm, I'm there's, the, there's the odd church. Like they're, they're, their services are three and a half hours long. Are you ready for this? Because I'm trying to get ahead to from between the worship to where the message starts. They take 20 minutes to take up the offering. And it's online. They're talking about giving. This is how you can connect. And the Lord's... Because it's a part of worship. That wasn't in my notes. But it's true. In John 5, verse 40, Jesus healed a blind man. And the religious people chose to be outraged. And lots of times, Jesus just kind of says, oh, you're a bunch of whitewashed tombs. Oh, you're whatever. He just ignores them and walks away. But at this particular time, he had quite a lengthy response. Because they were just livid that he'd healed somebody that was blind. And he said, you search and investigate and pour over scripture, thinking that you have eternal life through them. They testify about me, and yet you're not willing, you refuse, to come to me. Yeah, they didn't recognize Jesus. And in the scriptures it did. There was a, a model the, the, of the lamb, the sacrificial lamb. So they recognized that spiritually that was it, but they didn't recognize that he was that lamb. So this was really personal to Jesus. He said to them, you do not receive. Your hearts are no, not open. You give me no welcome. Like he just on them. This makes what I said last Sunday seem like, you know, <laughs> cotton candy. We must come to God on the basis of who he says he is and not who we want him to be. And I hit that this week with somebody. They're just like, you know what? Just, just you know what? They, it, they, want, they want you to believe that they love Jesus and they have a relationship with him, but we don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We don't believe in healing. And like, that's like telling me, you know, Charlene, I'm okay with you as long as you're co coaching figure skating. I'm okay with you as long as you're a mom and a grandma. But that preacher thing, that prophetic thing, that casting demons out thing, that's, I'm not okay with that part of you. I just want to interact with this part of you. We can't do that with God. And, and Michelle Paxa had a really interesting quote on her Facebook page yesterday. She said, when people interact with God on the basis of who they think he is, not who he really is, who they're comfortable with, they're not worshiping God, they're worshiping themselves. This is my picture of God. I was like, whoa, okay. I might have quoted that wrong, but you get the idea. And there are, we are hitting this as we come into this season of where God's going to manifest himself. He's going to manifest who he is, not who we want him to be. So when we come to God, we need to come to who he is. And my goodness, all we ever do is make him smaller. That's all we do. And all the things, all the, it's like, and limit his power. And he, he kind of, 
He said, you are content to receive praise, honor, and glory from one another. We're, we have our happy little social church group where we're all comfortable with each other. They made each other feel good. But he said, you do not seek the praise and honor and glory which come from him who alone is God. I was like, oh my goodness, I've never read that verse before. God wants to praise, honor, and glorify me. Wow. That's what it says in there. So you can either have it from man or you can have it from God, but you can't have both. So <laughs> they supposed things. They supposed, because, you know, Mary, illegitimate child, they supposed all kinds of things. He came from Nazareth. They did not believe and they did not trust. So we come to God humbly, expectantly, and intending to obey. And 1 Peter 2, 4 and 25, second to last point. Come to him, the living stone, which men tried and threw away. Oh, yeah, there it is again. They rejected Christ. But he wants them to come, and he's drawing them. They threw it away, but which is chosen and precious in God's sight? The first way we come is personally come to him. And then it says, come, and like living stones, be yourselves, plural, built into a house, many parts, for a holy dedicated priesthood to offer up those spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable and pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. We come personally, but we also are to come. How do we come to God? Corporately. There's this whole little strand of the body of Christ that thinks me and Jesus is good enough, but the word says it's not. We must come corporately. And he actually says, Peter says, for you are going astray. See, this is why we, we need each other. Because sometimes God uses each other to correct us. Hey, how are you doing? How are you doing? You okay? Yeah, good. Yeah, I got my eye on you. <laughs> Do you need prayer? Yeah. And I mean, it's like, it's easy for me. I look at somebody and go, oh, they need prayer. <laughs> I'm your pastor. So God shows, right? But it says, you were going astray, but now you've come back to the shepherd, who's over the whole flock, and the guardian of your soul. So we come to God through community. And that's important. And finally, we come to God because we need to see from his perspective, which is above, right now like we've never, ever needed before. Revelation 6, 3 17, 1 and 21, verse 9. The angels talk to John and they say, what do they say to him? Who's read Revelation? <laughs> I, I have come next to Ephesians to believe that that's the most fun book in the whole Bible. It is amazing. But the angels say, come up here, because he's on the island of Patmos. And he was in the spirit in the Lord's day, but his body was there. And they said, come up here. So he went right through the spirit realm, through the clouds, through the spirit realm, up into heaven. That's up. Come. Uh, okay, I'll tell this story. Do I have time for a story? I was praying once, and um, I had to go speak at a conference. And I was praying, and I felt such a strong anointing. I was just in our bedroom, and I felt such a strong anointing. And I could feel things swirling. And I'm like, I'm going up, and I panicked just being honest, and I just went, <gasps> no, and it, it was gone, and I feel like the Lord was going to take me somewhere, and after I got home from the <laughs> conference, <laughs> I'm like, I should have gone up, because <laughs> it was good, a little bit of warfare. Anyways, um, Paul also wrote in Ephesians, he said, we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, Far above all principalities and powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness and high praise places, we are above it. He wrote that. Ephesians was written after he wrote 1st or 2nd Corinthians, wherever he referenced it. He goes, I know a man, don't know if it was in his body or out of his body, but he went up to heaven. He's being all humble, because you know it's, it's him. So Paul had gone up to heaven at some point in time. 
And then he writes Ephesians, we're seated in heavenly places. Like that's revelation because he'd been up there. We're the body of Christ. And right now with everything that's going on, we must look. We have to stop when things come up and go, Bleh. Another reason why you really need to read Revelation. We are not going to wreck the earth. We're not that powerful that we can influence it one way or the other, and we are not going to have a third world war with the atomic weapon. And talk about living according to a lie. Let's build a bomb shelter so when it all goes off, we'll be in the bunker, and we'll come out in 20 years when all of the whatever stuff's gone. Well, you enjoy that 20 years. <laughs> but, right? It's like, right? They're living according to a fear-based lie. But this is like the whole, the world, the, so many people in the world are like, the world is going to, it's like, no. The world is going to get a little bit wrecked. And it's phenomenal. But God is going to do it. He's going to release things onto the earth. Because it's that sowing and reaping thing he's done since the Garden of Eden. And he says exactly what's going to happen to a third of the rivers and a third of the oceans, a third of the water. He says exactly what's going to happen to a third of the land, exactly what's going to happen to the sun. And he's like, and he just tells us. And it's not happening. And when it does, we'll either be in heaven or we'll be preaching Jesus like we've never preached him before. Because look at this in Revelation, this is where we're going. You, can, you need to give your heart to Jesus right now. So, we, see, we have to live according to the truth. But, and so when all of these things, crisis things come up in our face we need to stop we need to come and seat ourselves with Jesus he's saying come and sit up there and then look at it from God's perspective and then we need to listen because we come to obey what is he telling you to do in this moment what does he want you to say or who he wants you to pray with or whatever and then you just go do it. So we stop, we look, we listen, and then we obey. But we have to come up. Come up here. And, and I shared all that. I got through it all. God's good. Because there's, there is, in this season, an invitation to come like, like I haven't felt in the spirit before. And God wants, he is in the business of setting people free and equipping us. And so I just want to encourage you to, to shift the way you think. I have the desire to come all the time. Is that like revelation? Because we don't feel like it. Very rarely will your feelings line up with the truth of God's word. And to quote Joyce Meyer, this is one of my favorites, the quickest way to destroy your life is to live by your feelings rather than the word of God. So when it comes, even, even when we feel the come, then it's like, oh, I'm not good enough to come. It's like, oh, just turn around and say, you're a lying spirit because it's by the blood of Jesus. I come by the blood of Jesus. Period. Period. Nothing else. Not because I'm good enough, ever. Because he made a way. So, I'm, gonna, I'm challenging you corporately to begin to come to the corporate gatherings ready, expectantly, and listening. And I, and I want to encourage you to, be, to shift how you think about coming to Jesus every day, to coming with the Holy Spirit, and just having that. Yeah, I'll say it. You know, if the only time Brent ever hugged me was when he wanted something, he just wants to love us. He just wants to love us. And we need to let him love us so that we can spill it out everywhere else. Amen.
So, Father, we, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth. We thank you that it cut off all the lies. We thank you for giving us the power and the, to be responsible for our own lives. And that you've given us free will. And that wound around that is a desire to just be intimately yoked with you so that we hear the whispers, come. We hear the whispers and we say yes. 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 Amen.